So as Tamar said, I'm Rob. I like to talk a lot. Um, that's one of my jobs here. And so today we're going to talk about ad hoc, interactive, and in general, just asking questions because it's asking questions or getting fast answers is part of the problem. It's part of why ad hoc and interactive is becoming so important. We're going to talk through that and talk through what it means vis-a-vis -vis Athena and Snowflake and other data warehouses. So self-service is the new black, but it's the new reporting. And I'm going to explain a little bit what I mean by that. The reality is ad hoc is, is often used to answer new questions the first time. Analysts use it to answer one-off questions. Uh, but those one-off questions, when they're really important and you need to follow up on those questions again become the new reports and the new dashboards. Employees, and we saw a lot of a lot of you are do have employees using um, ad hoc and interactive as well. Employees use it to find and fix issues with data, looking at the data on the spot. So that could be network telemetry and service and support issues in a telco. It could be customer service related issues. Um, but a lot of the times you have to slice and dice and filter and drill down a little bit to find a root cause. And it's the same in marketing. Marketing campaigns are all about identifying a customer segment, drilling down, getting the contact info on that segment and following up with some kind of campaign. Customers increasingly um, are asking for more and more self-service and data and more slice and dice. I think um, what we get out of E-Trade and others in terms of analyzing portfolios is a start. Uh, and more and more, we're getting used to those kinds of analytics from other consumer facing parts of our life. And so more and more, you'll see analytics from um, SaaS offerings that are replacing operational uh, apps. Uh, to things like advertising analytics for marketing departments, and the list goes on. But regardless of what kind of analytics, the second it becomes one of our customers, uh, the SLA is the second or less. Uh, that's what we all expect. We, we leave. We start to abandon websites if they take more than a second for anything that we're doing. And that's important to keep in mind. So... Because most new questions are answered with some kind of ad hoc, and because we're trying to help more and more people use data for making decisions, self-service has become kind of critical and self-service ad hoc is starting to become critical. But the two challenges with it, the first one is it takes way too long to do um, ad hoc a good chunk of the time. And the reason is because often ad hoc either needs some kind of new optimization or some new data. So if I, if I look at the process the way I've been used to it for a good decade when it became, when I had to really map it out the first time, which was around 2010, um, it hasn't changed much. And if I look back even further, I realize that it's been there for a while. So typically what happens is analyst gets asked a question uh, and they start building out a new report for it. They'll lay out the rough data and then start laying out the format, but they have to have conversations with the business to figure out exactly what data is needed. And by the way, the business often doesn't quite know all the data they need. And then have a conversation with the data warehouse team when they're missing some data. Often the data warehouse team says, well, I don't have that data yet. And that starts a conversation with the data integration team or the data prep team or the ETL team, whatever you call them, to go back and look at uh, raw sources of the data, figure out which one's the best version of the truth, figure out how to merge the data with other data that they have, cleanse it, make it consistent, move it into the warehouse, change the schema of the warehouse to, to fold it in, start the ETL, test the ETL, get it into the warehouse, test the warehouse, and release. And they have to test it because everybody else is using the warehouse. It's called an enterprise data warehouse. It's a big shared resource and a lot of people are dependent on it. You touch the warehouse, it takes a month. That's always kind of been the unwritten rule that there's a lot of testing and changes that have to go on to um, 
to get new data in. And usually people even batch up several changes at a time because there is so much overhead. So touch it, it takes a month. After a month, the data starts surfacing. They tell the analyst, hey, it's ready. The analyst can pretty quickly jump and build a new report in, in Looker or Tableau, uh, or if you wanna go further back, uh, MicroStrategy, Cognos, and the list goes on, BO. But the, uh, they build the report, they show it in the business, the business people look at it and go, that's great, but, and they realize they either didn't explain the requirements right, or they weren't heard right, or they're just a piece of data missing because now they see something else. This cycle goes on average one to three times around. So because it takes so long to move data in, this can take one to three months before the business gets the final answer they're looking for. Um, and this is a problem because all of you who have dealt with this problem before know that the number one answer from the business and when they need this is yesterday. So that means maybe you have one to two days to figure it out before they start getting a little upset because they're getting pressure from higher up to answer that question. And that's the problem. That's the first problem. The second problem is that they expect the performance to be interactive, to move as fast as they're thinking, which generally tends to be one second. That was, was one of the presents of the internet that if it's, and Google and others have measured this, the further out you get to uh, away from a single second or beyond a single second, the, the higher the attrition starts exploding and it, and it really goes fast. So the unwritten rule is you've got about one second SLA and as an expectation. People accept longer because they have to, but one second's become the norm and there are many uh, more mission critical analytics SLAs you'll see out there where they say for the, for the most important uh, ad hoc kinds of analytics, it's a second. And there are gonna be issues if it's longer than a second. If you look at benchmarks out there, uh, of course, you realize that most cloud data warehouses and federated query engines like Athena or Presto, which is what Athena is really built on, they take a lot longer. Uh, even for a terabyte, if you look at the Fivetran benchmark and a four billion row fact table, which sounds huge, but actually it's becoming pretty commonplace. For first time queries, and by that I mean fetching the data the first time, not having it cached, it takes about eight to 11 seconds on average on clusters that are not cheap. That would cost you 150,000 bucks to 300,000 bucks to run 24 seven for, uh, you know, for a year. So that's neither uh, cheap nor fast. These queries could be eight to 11 on, on average, but some are gonna take, they ran into the minutes when they ran the tests of about a hundred back-to-back first time queries. So uh, that's not nearly fast enough for ad hoc. If you dig into why, what's the problem? The first one is the storage and the second one is the compute. And that those are the two bottlenecks with a decoupled storage and compute architecture. I think part of the problem is that a lot of the modern cloud data warehouses first targeted traditional reporting and dashboard workloads, which was what people were asking for. Um, let me take my traditional analytics to the cloud. And uh, the, the industry's done that pretty well, but they didn't focus as much on speed. And so uh, when they needed speed, they would throw elastic scale at the problem and just throw more compute resources. The problem is um, the network is one of the biggest bottlenecks when it comes to storage. So the way most cloud data warehouses access data, whether we're talking about um, Snowflake, or we're talking about Athena, they're gonna pull partitions over the network. So they'll use something called a pruning index to figure out which partitions might be needed so that they limit their access. But the, the lowest level of granularity is the entire partition that has, the, that has a range of data where you might need data out of that partition. So for something like Snowflake, you're pulling a micro partition of 50 to 150 megabytes over, and you're pulling many of these over. Uh, that takes seconds 
The second bottleneck is the cache, uh, sorry, is the compute, where uh, your queries aren't necessarily optimized for speed. And, and query optimization has a, a broad range of optimizations across different nodes. And so if you run the queries, you'll see that those are taking seconds as well. And so the question is, how do you limit the network uh, data movement and how do you optimize the queries to get sub-second in both places? That's the big question and that's what you have to tackle when you're looking at ad hoc. So that decade ago, when I started looking at ad hoc explicitly, four requirements popped out. Um, and they pop out when you look at the end-to-end -end process and you try to re-engineer the process to make it faster. First one is you have to be able to grab new data and add it at any time on your own. Can't be dependent on someone else. The second, you need to improve performance in some more general way. You can't be slicing and dicing and then each time you have to do a new operation, go tune something. You have to be able to do things in a second or less without worrying about the performance. The third is uh, do any analysis on your own. You can't be waiting for someone else. And the fourth, you got to do this in isolation. You cannot um, do an ad hoc query that suddenly brings everybody else down because you're hogging all the resources in the cluster. This is actually one of the biggest problems with Athena. Athena and BigQuery are shared resources. And so they have to throttle each user in the shared resource to limit them to make sure that they're protecting everybody else to deliver a certain SLA. There's some ways around it, but in general, as a shared resource, uh, you have to limit what everybody does. So the accidental query could bring everybody else down. Well, uh, sometimes in ad hoc, you have to do those accidental queries. And sometimes you gotta do them without a ton of cost and a ton of impact on others. And so how do you solve that problem? The answer is you need a data lake and a data warehouse. Now, uh, just like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the answer is easy. It's the question and how you do it that's hard. And so what I wanna do is spend some time drilling down into how this actually works, starting with the process. So what's changed when people start doing more interactive ad hoc is first, they add the data lake. The data integration team, instead of spending their time moving everything into the data warehouse, moves it into a data lake. Now, for those of you using Hadoop, you may have started this way as well. Um, my experiences with Hadoop were with Cloudera back in 2010, 11, 12, where we were starting to, uh, when I was at Informatica, starting to work on staging areas in front of Teradatas and other data warehouses. And so, the data integration team at that point is spending most of their time doing the same kind of ETL, ELT, ETLT, transforming the data into some use, usable but raw form into a data lake. From which point anybody can pick up that raw data and do anything with it, okay? So when an analyst or a data engineer or both, depending on how uh, seasoned your analysts are and how much you let them do, as they're doing their analysis, when they get to the point where they don't have the data they need, they have that conversation. The data engineer, uh, that persona, who could be an analyst as well, then quickly does some ELT from the data lake and loads it into the data warehouse in hours. Now, you need to be able to load it into a place where nobody else is gonna be impacted but they load it in and from that point, uh, someone, the analyst or the same person uh, who acted as the engineer brings it into the report and formulates, you know, brings it all together, shows it to the business person and within a day, within 24 hours as an SLA, uh, shows it, gets feedback and decides, am I gonna do this cycle again? Did I miss something? But the point is, the rapid prototyping is now happening on a daily basis, not a monthly basis. They're getting the feedback in a day. That's what ad hoc needs to look like. 
okay? Independently, you've decoupled what the data integration team is doing, what the data warehousing team is doing to evolve the data warehouse to support all the other needs, the reporting and dashboards and optimizing the data. So they can do their stuff on their own, but this process, which somehow magically happens, allows ad hoc to happen faster. Now, uh, it's hard. So what I wanna do is spend the majority of the time explaining how this is actually implemented today with the technologies we have. Because since the early days of Hadoop and staging areas, a lot's evolved around data lakes and around um, data warehouses and how they turn on this kind of self-service and isolation of the work. We could talk about data lakes for hours. I think there are a few things that I just wanna point you towards so that you can get a sense of where you might need to look uh, to help avoid some of the biggest mistakes. The, the first I'd say is um, your data integration team is gonna spend a lot of time moving data into the data lake. For those of you using Hadoop, you probably viewed it as your single source of the truth. You might even have been doing ad hoc on top of it. Um, yes, I was, I was there uh, when we started doing that the first time and realized the unfortunate truth about Hive uh, and then even Presto about performance. So you're going to spend time moving your data and bringing it together into a data lake. It is raw data. You want to let people do many different things with it, but there's still some structure and some quality and consistency you have to add to it. So in other words, you're going to have to depend on the G word, the governance word, and think about exactly how much governance you need to put in, the minimal amount, to make the data lake usable. Do things like have enough of a catalog that people can find the data that they need and enough of the tooling to allow them to do self-service. The second point I'd make, and this is one I learned the hard way, I learned a lot of my lessons the hard way, is um, you need to make the data lake independent of the compute. And for several years, for me, they, they could be the same. Uh, in fact, that was Hadoop, right? You had storage and you had compute and it was okay to have the compute associated with it. But you need to allow data to be accessed by anything independent of the compute. And so if I go back to James Dixon, um, who I knew from the late 90s, and James wrote the definition on uh, data lake, he said it's storage. And so I actually, I went back to him to clarify and to get this straight in my head precisely for that reason that no, that it has to be just storage with maybe some compute, but the access has to be independent so that you can use the data anywhere. And that's key because if you put your, if you implement your data lake in a data warehouse, the compute around the data warehouse is expensive and it is limiting. It does limit the things you can do with data. And it actually limits the way you store the data because a lot of data warehouses, um, they don't store JSON and semi-structured data very well. They kind of, they're limited in their support. So focus on it just being about the storage, not about the compute. But I think that's enough for now about data lakes. Let's go into um, the, uh, how you get the performance. Because there are a few lessons learned there. Um, the first one is when you're loading in uh, data, you're going to be doing this as more of a self-service ELT process. You might do it as SQL using DBT. That's the approach we take. There might be a graphical way of doing it, but it's going to be self-service. And the only place, the only time you have to optimize that data for, for performance is during your ELT, because after that, you really shouldn't have to worry about it. So during that process, whatever indexes and other structures and optimizations you need to do has to happen the same way at the same time in the same way, okay? Once you do that, then what happens is uh, hopefully though that new data and those new indexes are completely isolated from the existing data and indexes so that you can bring up a new cluster, a new compute cluster that can combine the new data and the new indexes completely independently with the old data and indexes and use it in the new ad hoc way that it needs to use it. 
without impacting any of the existing workloads that are going on, that are just using the existing storage and indexes on their own without even realizing that this new stuff exists. That's the way to pull it off. Okay, so that's what allows people to do ad hoc on the sources, so you're not impacting the existing workloads and without um, requiring the testing that we'd have to do if we were changing uh, the shared schema and the shared indexes. Uh, so you need to make these things isolated, uh, both the compute and the storage, as well as the changes to allow this kind of process to happen. It's gonna take a while to explain this. So I'm gonna go through and spend the rest of the time here on explaining exactly how this works. And then we'll, we'll take some questions. And tomorrow, let me know if questions are coming up. But I think the first thing you should realize is that this requires a decoupled storage and compute architecture, okay? And the reason is you need to be able to bring up new resources that can use the same data, but completely isolate the compute from everybody else. So it's not just about elastic scale on the data side, like what RA3 introduces to uh, Redshift. You actually need the ability to use the same data with any infinite number of different clusters or introduce new data, combine it with the existing data and introduce it into this new um, computing cluster. And the only, um, the only uh, data warehouses or federated query engines uh, that can do this is when they completely decouple storage from compute, like a Snowflake or a Firebolt or maybe an Athena or Presto. The second thing you need to realize is you can't rely on denormalization for performance. It doesn't work for two reasons. One, it doesn't work for big data. You can't just join two big fact tables together and load this thing in. Um, in the case of something like Athena, we've had customers where uh, they can't go beyond a 5 billion row table. So when they tried to merge a 40 billion row table with a six or an 8 billion row table, they were done. Um, so for big data, it doesn't work, but for isolating changes, it doesn't work either because you need to be able to take your new data, join it with your old data to protect all the old workloads. Denormalization doesn't do that. You have one changing dimension, which just happens a lot actually or you have to add new columns, everybody gets impacted. And so uh, you need joins both for big data and you need it for isolation as well. So the way this works now is as you're doing your self-service ELT, you're loading it in with SQL using DBT or whatever you use. Um, in our case, you'd be using DBT or straight SQL, writing your ingestion loading it in to create new tables or possibly even adding columns to an existing table, both of which are completely out of band with what um, existing analytics workloads would be seeing. You need to be able in your self-service ELT to add new tables independently um, as new data, like a new fact table or add columns to an existing table if that's where it belongs both can be isolated from the existing data. Now, some people will say, why do you add a full fact table? Uh, and the answer is because sometimes you're gonna need that lowest level of granularity and you, know, you don't need to, you don't wanna have to go back and load it after the fact at a lower level. And there's some tricks you can do to aggregate up that we'll go through later. But load your lowest level uh, that you're gonna need uh, down the road and then keep that as a separate fact table. Do the joins as you need them to do the analysis uh, between the new, you know, with the new and the existing data combined. Second lesson, uh, I got reminded of this about three months ago, I was talking to someone um, who's been in the industry for a while and we were talking about indexes and they said, look, if you have to plan in advance and add an index, it's not real ad hoc, is it? And I think what the question was, was if I have to go ask someone else to do work in advance for me, every time I wanna do ad hoc, that's not true ad hoc. If I can do it on my own in advance when I'm looking at new data and new analyses and turn something on and get my work done quickly, that's okay. 
But ideally, I don't want to have to plan in advance at all. I just want to be able to do it. And so the short answer to that is you, the only time you really should be doing any optimization, if at all, is when you bring in new data. Say what you're, you're going to need to do with the data, no matter what, during the ELT process, do it once and leave it alone. And so in the case of Firebolt, the way that works, you declare on each table a primary index. Indexing matters. Uh, we realize that pretty early on, we're one of the few that actually turns on any kind of indexing and we turn it on extensively. So you turn on a, a primary index for a table so that it gets partitioned and sorted the right way for the analyses that you're gonna do. And same thing with additional columns. You can turn on other kinds of indexes as well. And we'll talk about when do you turn on additional indexes that you need as you need them. But you turn on whatever you need, whether it's uh, uh, for the fact table, just a primary index, a primary composite key based index, or even some aggregations as well. And then leave it alone. That's, you do that during the ELT process. From that point on, if you bring up a new engine to do ad hoc, or you have a separate engine that's doing ad hoc for those new users, they are the only ones that are gonna pull in that know about this new data, that are gonna pull it in and use it. The, the other users do have the option of doing it, but the new work, the data and the related indexes are only related to the new stuff. And if you, if you, you adhere to a couple of rules, if you think through it and think, okay, this is, this is how I'm gonna limit the impact. I'm gonna have this primary key that's only on the that table, that's limited. I'm gonna maybe do some aggregating indexes on that new table and that's limited. You'll realize, hey, I just, I just insulated that new work from everybody else, because in this decoupled storage and compute architecture, only the new compute cluster and the new users are pulling in this new stuff. And you've accomplished your goal of isolating uh, the changes. So you don't have to test. The way the primary index works is this. You pick your columns that you're gonna do any predicates on or filtering. You put them in the primary key. Firebolt does two things with that. Um, during ingestion, it's sorting the data and writing one row or a million rows at a time and uh, managing the partitions, uh, allowing you to do immediate writes, but then also combining segments and partitions over time under the covers to optimize performance. When it's accessing the data, it asks the index, where's the data? If it wants a range of data, the index says it's right there in those two partitions. It goes to those two segments, partitions. It only pulls the data that it needs. It does not pull the partitions over the network. That means you're pulling 10x, maybe less data over the network, which means you're getting, you're able to get down to sub-second network access. The query optimization engine is also looking and figuring out how do I um, order my queries, put joins at the end, um, use various indexes to get to sub-second query times. The combination is what gives you the sub-second performance, the sub-second network access, the sub-second query runtimes. The um, benchmarks show one to two orders of magnitude typically of difference between the two where if we look at the demo we do in the product showdown, for example, we're doing 10 to 20 times the amount of data, we're running it on a cluster that's a fourth the cost and we're getting seven times faster performance. So in that case, it's two orders of magnitude better performance. That's what comes out of this combination of indexing for network, for data access and for query optimization and um, uh, performance overall. Couple more rules about this quickly. Um, the first one is most query optimization engines should think like Yoda. Always at the end with indexing, you must join. That's what he'd say. You need to think about how you, uh, in any engine like that, and you need to benchmark this. How does the query optimization do all the filtering and the predicates before the tables are joined to shrink the size of both tables and uh, minimize the impact of a join? And then how do you use indexing with joins to accelerate the joins even more? So in the case of uh, Firebolt, there's a join index. So the query optimizer is doing all this uh, 
it's you know got all the moves like Yoda, it's putting the join at the end. And then it has an in-memory join index, which is a hash table that turns full scans across the tables into a hash lookup and a lookup across the other table. So it turns the, the full scans into a series of specific lookups that are going off the primary index, which is really fast. So the combination is part of what you're seeing in those benchmark numbers. And 90% of the time, the primary index is gonna execute everything you need. If you put the columns in the uh, index that you need, you're gonna get the performance. There are one or two things you might consider. And the first one is adding a materialized view or an aggregation where you aggregate up from the fact table so you have less data and you pre-compute your operations. And then it's gonna be blazingly fast and people don't need even to think about it. And you'll have to decide when you wanna add that extra level of performance, uh, when it's worth it and why you do it. But the way that works is uh, that's called an aggregating index in Firebolt. It is a materialized view, it, but it supports all of the operations of um, of that you'd expect in a full materialized view that you got used to in the traditional data warehouses. You're gonna look in some cloud data warehouses and see the materialized view operations are limited. They're limited aggregating functions and their limitations in what you can do with a materialized view. So you have to watch that carefully. And you also have to look at how much overhead there is in a materialized view. Because in something like a snowflake, if you're doing clustering and you want it to automatically resort, it's pretty expensive. Most of the seasoned Snowflake uh, deployments I've seen, they offload the uh, resorting. They move it upstream to the ETL and they rewrite periodically into Snowflake. So watch carefully to see how materialized views actually work and benchmark it and let it benchmark it over a little bit of time to see how much of the impact is uh, where you might have to resort, how much degradation you get as you do more writes. Um, but that's basically what aggregating indexes do. So the query optimization engine automatically looks for new indexes and swaps them in when it sees certain operations or certain types of aggregation levels that it needs to use. A couple other warnings before we go on to questions. The first one I'd say is beware of flat data. This is a flat data problem. Upstream, the world was not flat. It was, it was structured, uh, it was JSON. And we like to ask questions that are structured questions, like what path did a customer go through before it abandoned its shopping cart? What other products were those customers interested in so that we can do uh, recovery campaigns, so that we can understand how to fix our website, so we can understand how to deliver a better customer experience. Those end up being deeply nested queries in uh, relational data once we flattened it, which is the kiss of death uh, to any data warehouse. So you need to be ready to support JSON because there are going to be questions coming up that are JSON or semi-structured like problems. And, and that's one of the reasons that we added native semi-structured support where we can have recursive nested structures in a column stored that way and added Lambda style functions into SQL to support native JSON and SQL relational queries together. Um, and you're gonna look at support in other cloud data warehouses like um, take Snowflake where you just embed the JSON as text. And the problem is that when you embed it as text and it's not native, uh, a native structure, you have to pull all the JSON into RAM and do full scans through it to do the operations, which requires a lot of RAM. So you end up having to double your, your cluster size and double your cluster size and double your cluster size to get slightly larger nodes each time until you get to a point where you have enough RAM where you're not spilling the disk in, in Snowflake. And there's similar challenges in some other cloud data warehouses. When you make this structured and performant and you match it with the right uh, functions, you end up needing a lot less RAM, a lot less compute, and you get better performance for your buck. So you really want to be benchmarking some of your JSON as well and thinking about how people are doing ad hoc with JSON. These questions about customers are fundamentally ad hoc. So beware of that. The final lesson I'd pass on is ad hoc is for everyone. 
That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get interactive uh, types of analytics and ad hoc types of analytics to all the employees so that they can answer questions as part of their job. And eventually you're getting it out to customers as well. Most of the high tech SaaS companies we work with, they're doing external facing analytics. They're delivering some service to their customers. You need to be able to scale and data warehouses were not designed for high user concurrency. They assumed that it was an analyst team. So I can't tell you how many times I would see Vertica hit a limit between 30 and 100 concurrent users before it just would stop. Athena hits a limit of uh, 20 by default. Um, you go above 20 concurrent users, you're done. So we had one customer who was trying to do, uh, they went from 200 to 1,000 users and they were done with Athena for that reason and just for the, the size of the data they were using. Um, so you need to make sure that you're gonna be able to support the users that you see one to three years down the road. Otherwise, you're gonna be adding a second technology to support the concurrency. So uh, you're gonna see Snowflake and uh, Firebolt and any modern uh, decoupled storage and compute architecture. You're gonna see it supporting uh, user concurrency by just scaling out horizontally. And it works pretty well. Um, you're gonna look for your number of users. You're gonna try to calculate what's that gonna take, the size of the, the warehouses or clusters or engines how much do I have to scale out? Do I have the right size? Is the workload matching the way I'm scaling out? And what's my eventual cost? Because you're gonna to wanna to pick a good price performance for a lot of users. You don't wanna be in a situation where this is costing you hundreds of dollars a user to support, and you have to scale up to thousands or tens of thousands of users. Um, that gets too expensive too fast. So you need to benchmark that out as well and, and understand what you're in for in terms of costs. These are a lot of lessons. Um, there are some lessons learned here around um, ad hoc. There's some things I didn't even talk about that I'd love to talk about more. But remember, if you, if you remember nothing else, to really get to self-service ad hoc, which is the new reporting to support this, you're gonna need to do your data lake right. Think about it as storage with enough governance and self-service a data warehouse that can support a self-service approach to getting the data and optimizing it um, to support ad hoc quickly. And this, this cycle, the self-service cycle in the middle where you can support both the ELT and the optimization and then deliver these new isolated workloads to let everybody um, ask the right questions quickly. So uh, I hope that helps. I'd love to cover some more. I'd love to hear some questions. I feel like I didn't talk enough about Athena. And so I, I'd also like to hear questions about Athena, about Hadoop and We have questions about Athena. Okay. We have questions. We have a lot of questions. I'll, I'll try to, and not a lot of time. So I'll get to the, the ones okay. that repeated themselves. But just one last question, intriguing question I have for everyone. So if Rob, you can make me the mm -hmm. host for just one second. We have yes. one last, one last question, and then we'll get to your interesting questions and answer you guys there you go here we go so one last poll question would you like to check out far for this amazing presentation so yes can't wait to get my hands on this beast or you like her query slow Okay, I, I see the number is still going up. Okay, if, if I'm stopping the poll, but you can contact us anyway. So, ending poll. Now, questions. Um, so, regarding Athena, yes, we have why not just use Athena as a federated query engine across whatever sources I need and do ad hoc that way? Yeah, I didn't, I missed this. Um... So back in the day when I was starting to work on self-service, I actually was working on a federated query engine. The, the idea was, well, if you can't get at the data because it's not in the data warehouse, 
and the data integration pipeline's too slow, reach back to the root sources and just query them directly. The problem with a federated query engine is that it's, and, and it was the right approach back then, okay? Because you didn't have the raw data together. There was no such thing as a data lake. Problem with a federated query engine is it's not optimized with all of the raw data that is the storage. And no matter how much caching you do, if you haven't hit that data before, you have to fetch it over the network. And the second you have to fetch that much data over the network, you are done. So when it comes to big data, you're gonna be waiting way too long. If you know the raw data you might be interested in and you can spend the time bringing it together, if the data integration team can bring it together into a single source called a data lake, then you kind of know, you, you give people a self-service way of bringing in the data. In other words, if you can build a pipeline into a data warehouse and let people move it in on their own, you're gonna get the performance. But if you have to do a federated query over the network with a, an Athena where the, the storage is not optimized with the compute, so you have to fetch entire partitions, um, you're kind of done when it comes to performance. You can go search the first time for the data that way and profile it. But when you're actually doing ad hoc, you need the data together and you need it optimized with the compute. So that's, that's most of the, that's the biggest issue with Athena. There's another question here that, that we're getting a lot. Um, how is this different from Snowflake? We have a lot of technical questions, but these are the ones that are really repeating themselves, like competitor questions. Snowflake is different in uh, that first, the data access is by micropartition. So 50 to 150 megabytes at a time. It's not pulling the data, only the data that it needs. And that, that's way too slow. That, that brings you into seconds pretty easily because you can move a gigabyte a second fully loaded on most networks. We're talking terabytes. You can't do that. Um, second is the query optimization, which you, you can really only see in the benchmarks, but I think you should um, think of it this way. A primary index that only pulls the data it needs and, primary, and indexes matter is gonna be so much faster than pulling partitions and doing full scans even if you cache the partitions in SSD, then um, just pulling that data range from SSD. And that's where part of the 10X improvement in performance comes. The other one is um, uh, materialized views in Snowflake are pretty expensive, especially in sorting. The materialized views in uh, Firebolt use exactly the same mechanism for data access which is pulling just the data range, not partitions, which in materialized views and Snowflake, you're still pulling partitions. And again, they have the indexing and they have uh, more aggregation counts, like distinct count, uh, more aggregation functions than what Snowflake has, because Snowflake hasn't actually turned on all the aggregating functions that you'd expect. So you need to evaluate what the cost is of sorting in a materialized view, um, the actual performance of the materialized view, and the functions you need. I think when you compare those, you're going to see the aggregating indexes are much better as well. The, the final thing is if you're doing trickle feed or incremental writes, you're going to see a big difference because Snowflake is predominantly batch or micro batch. It's a minute or longer. I think those are the biggest differences. You'll see a big difference in cost. Cost is a problem. Um, it's usually not why people change. Yeah, someone here also mentioned, you said Snowflake doesn't support native JSON, but as far as I understand, we have the variant column. Yep. Um, but so I guess Snowflake, that's a whole... <laughs> yep, so Snowflake has something called a variant column where you can ingest JSON, for example, put it into the variant column as text, and as it's ingesting, it's building up the metadata so it knows how to compute the, the JSON. And when you need the JSON, let's say you have a million row table and 1K JSON in each field, you pull a full gigabyte of a million 1K bits of JSON into RAM. So your node has to have an extra gigabyte available to do, and that's without the overhead, the header and other stuff you might need for managing the JSON. But let's say it's a gigabyte. You have to pull that all into RAM in a single node that's doing that join or the querying and process it. And it's doing full scans through all this text to parse through the JSON, more like a DOM model of JSON, um, 
and and figure out what to um, what to do with the JSON. In the case of Firebolt, we store it as a nested array structure. It's not text. We walk it like an array, like pointers, going through it as we're doing our Lambda style uh, functions inside SQL. So we're not loading everything into RAM. We can do much smaller nodes with less RAM and less CPU as a result. And that's where we get our performance on our JSON side. We usually, we call that a big node problem in Snowflake. And we do, we get into several conversations where people are having to create these huge clusters you know, choose an extra large or larger just for their JSON compute because they needed to grow the cluster size to get just a large enough node in that cluster where they could load in their JSON without spilling over to SSD or disk. And that's, that's the big difference is the variant column is just text and that causes issues when you scale. Um, okay, let's, let's take another question. Does Firebolt support SQL? Um, Firebolt supports 100% ANSI SQL with one exception. You also have the Lambda style array functions in there. So it's full DDL and full DML. Okay, I'm gonna take another question. Like we're running out of time, but I see that people are still on. So, <laughs> so let's take another question. Um, why load a fact table to the lowest level of resolution? Yes, that's a good one. Um, I've struggled with this one. You know, why not just uh, aggregate to the level that you think you need at the moment um, and then deal with it down the road because it's expensive. If you're not doing denormalized tables, if you're doing fact tables, um, a lot of the analysis you're doing is um, at some point you do some ad hoc, you analyze revenues by region, by product, by customer. So all aggregate aggregating operations, but at some point, you need to drill down to the details to, ant to do some kind of recovery campaign or go check inventory, do a recall. That drill down is actually down to the fact table. So if you load the fact table, but then for your faster operations and your, your um, counts, if you build an aggregating index on top, you get the best of both worlds. You get the super fast distinct count operations, you know, revenue calculations that you need with much smaller space because it it's at a higher aggregating level. But when you need to do the drill down, which is what a lot of people, a lot of employees need to do, they need to get down to the details. It's all there in the data warehouse. So you've done, you know, you've, you've done some slicing and dicing, you've gotten the, the results that you need, and now you do your drill down query. And it's a really, with a primary index on that fast table, it's a fact table, it's super fast. You get down to the results that you need and then the employees walk away with that. So they have everything they need in the data warehouse to, to do their combination of ad hoc root cause, get the result they need and move on. And that's, that's actually why um, one reason you need the fact table, the lowest level. The other one is there are some rock, rocket scientist kinds of analysts who want to get down to the next level because they're looking to solve a new problem. And if it's any kind of shared resource and other people have become dependent on that fact table, changing the granularity after the fact, that takes a month. Now you've gotten into a cycle where you have to um, iterate and test everything. My recommendation is pick a lower level of granularity you think most people are going to need and just load that in because you know what, S3 is cheap and modern cloud data warehouses are usually not charging you for the S3. So, so load it in there and let people use it. Okay, let's, let's do one last question just because okay. there's a lot and I wanna, I wanna answer as many people as possible, but we're gonna answer the rest of you personally. One last question. When should I use a primary index versus an aggregating or joint index? And that um, will be the last one for today. Great, so um, I think of it this way. Uh, if I'm analyzing a table and I know I'm gonna use some, some columns as predicates uh, and I haven't created this huge denormalized wide table, you know, I've got five to 10 different kinds of columns I'm gonna use a lot, throw them in the primary. The performance off of that, you're not gonna need another uh, index generally, uh, 80 to 90% of the time. If you're gonna do this um, operators 
you know, different aggregating functions, you can add an aggregating index to it and the query optimization engine will decide when to use the aggregating index. If you need something else, the aggregating index can actually be used to make a, a second copy of the fact table. Uh, it has its own primary index. Just add different columns to that different aggregating index and you've got your, your second copy basically being maintained. You don't need that that often, but the option is there. Um, there are skipping indexes where you can go off primary and use the skipping index. Uh, they're join indexes, but I think for me, add the columns that you need in the primary when you need to go around it. Um, aggregating is for the group by operations, and it can also be used to counter the, the original primary index and create a second one. That's the short answer. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining. Uh, follow us on LinkedIn to keep up with our next webinars and more content uh, being launched. Our next webinar is going to be a performance uh, showdown between all of the different vendors, so you don't want to miss it. So follow us for all the dates, all the upcoming content. Uh, thank you, Rob.